Well, this morning we're going to return to our study of this great book that we've been looking at, just beginning to get our, ourselves into this rich passage of Scripture. And uh, just so you know, I, th- I think about this a lot now, the older I'm getting. I may never get a chance to preach this book again. I'm kind of saying that with every book I preach now. This might be it. You know, it was different 22 years ago when I first preached this book, uh, many years ago in Southern California. Uh, but I've just enjoyed going back through it again. So just so you know, we're going to go slow. I mean, slower than you think. <laughs> we're going to go slow. It's a wonderfully rich opening in this first chapter of First Thessalonians. And, and I really do want us to get our heart around what it is saying, and how we need to respond to it. I want you to remember that all of chapter 1 in 1 Thessalonians pivots off of that phrase you find in verse 2. We give thanks to God always for all of you. Everything in the chapter pivots off of that. And he expressed that gratitude in a number of ways. Verse 2, making mention of you in our prayers. That's one of the ways he expresses that gratitude. Verse 3, constantly bearing in mind. That's another way he gives thanks. And then verse 4, knowing God's choice. So I want to start this morning just by asking you how you've done this week. How have you done this week in intentionally cultivating true biblical gratitude in your heart for your church. You remember last week we said to do that, you need to give yourself to intentional intercession. There were just three, as we talked about it, intentional disciplines that you would cultivate in order to have a kind of real gratitude in your heart. So how have you done this week? How have you been doing in cultivating intentional intercession? That's what the apostle was doing in verse 2. He's giving, giving attention to prayer He's making mention of the Thessalonians in prayer. That's what causes him to give much gratitude and have much gratitude in his heart. Did you incorporate that into your times of dedicated and intentional prayer this week? Did you do that? Did you carve out and protect and pursue consistent time just to have prayer this week? And and if you did, did you concentrate on the various ways that God was at work in our congregation so as to build gratitude to him for his activity among us? How did you do that? Did you write some things down perhaps that come to your mind of how you are grateful for God and what he's doing among us? Did you intentionally pursue gratitude in prayer as you were praying for the people of our congregation? How did you become personal in the ways in which you prayed for people in our church this week? Did you engage in any intentional conversations that caused your heart to be thankful for the activity of God among us? Did you use it as a springboard for intercession? That's how you use this. Are you intentionally praying for people in our church? You say, well, I'm looking for that that new directory you promised. It's coming. It's coming bigger than you've ever seen it. It's coming. Yes, I'm sure. I don't want to comment anymore on that. It's coming. We ran out of paper. We'll get it to you next week, all right? There's a lot of people we have to put in that directory now, and uh, we're really thankful for that. Did you give attention to intentional intercession? What about intentional reflection? That's what we saw in verse 3, intentional reflection, constantly bearing in mind, bringing to mind, remembering, remembering specific things. And you see it in verse 3, the work of faith, the labor of love, the steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. As I I thought about that over the week and and I mentioned to you that I was going to have a conversation with someone about what God was doing in our church and And I did, and I I zeroed in on this verse, and I said, I really do see this in our congregation. I I see people making decisions based on what they believe about Christ. I see how they're shaping their life because of their faith. There's easier roads for some to travel, and they would say, no, Christ would have me walk this way. And they do, even though it's a harder road. That's a work of faith. 
I see the labor of love that is intense and at times exhausting among many in our congregation, pouring themselves out for the good of others, devoted to the spiritual care of each other. I see that. I hear it in testimonies. It is a profound work of God among us. I even hear people talking more about their hope in the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ that gives them a steadiness right now in light of everything that's happening. I mean, how many conversations did you have this week about what's going on in Ukraine? This is a big deal that's going on. I'm I'm not sure anyone in our lifetime who's sitting here in this room, no one in this generation has seen this kind of activity. This is very unique. It's shaking the globe but it shouldn't shake us. You do know, no matter what happens, God is moving the pieces on the board to be exactly where he wants to bring everything to a place in which ultimately the Lord Jesus will, will return. And so we're, we're steady. And I hear that in your voice. So that, that creates deep gratitude in me for what God is doing among us when we live that way. That is uncommon. That is unnatural. That's the work of God in his people. Did you bring up actions like that in your mind as you've engaged with people? Have you been engaging in the kind of fellowship to where you would hear those activities of faith and devotion that shows itself in exhausting labors? Have you been listening to people root and ground their heart? Have you been sharing that kind of stuff so as to encourage others? Have you been looking for it and praying for it? That's an intentional kind of reflection. And and listen, the more we pray for each other this way, the more we reflect on these kinds of spiritual truths, the deeper, the higher, the broader our gratitude for the congregation will be. Well, this morning I want to turn to the third, the third intentional discipline that would create and grow a constant gratitude in our heart for our church, and that is intentional comprehension. Intentional comprehension. It starts in verse 4, and it actually will go to the end of the chapter in verse 10. Everything from verses 4 through verse 10, are all about this pivot point in verse 4, knowing, brethren, beloved by God, his choice of you. There's an intentional comprehension. There is an intentional knowledge that the Apostle Paul has of this church. He brings it up often. Verse 5, we'll talk about how he knows God's choice of them. And God's choice is reflected in the way Paul came to them, how the gospel came to them. In verses 6 through 10 is another way he knows God's choice of them, and it's how they responded to the gospel when Paul came to them. So we're going to unpack that next week. Because I want us to focus on verse 4. I want us to think through this carefully. What kind of intentional knowledge does Paul have? How does he know this? And and what is this knowledge that he has that causes such incredible gratitude in his heart for this church? Well, it's very clear. Knowing, brethren, beloved by God, his choice of you. This is a deeply profound, very important phrase. You look at what drives Paul to his knees and knees in prayerful gratitude. It's not something that he hopes is true about the Thessalonians. It's not what he wishes were true about them, but what he is absolutely confident and certain is true about them. He knows this. And as we said in the opening message to this book when we walk through this together, This word for knowledge, this knowing is very important throughout the book. The word is used 17 times. And it doesn't refer to something that's theoretically known as if it were just a statement in a textbook. This is something that has personal knowledge connected to it. Paul is confident because he's been involved with them. He's seen what God did in him in his preaching. He's seen what God has done in them when he preached the gospel to them. So he knows He knows this about them. 
It's a confident fact. It's understood. It's comprehended through personal interaction. Now, most of the time in this book, the word to know in those 17 times that it's used, it's normally referring to what the Thessalonians know personally and experientially about Paul. But here, this is what he knows about them. What is true can be confirmed by what is experienced. I want you to think about that. We do need to be careful when we talk about personal experience, but we don't need to deny it. Truth is not defined by what you experience personally. That's a very important thing to keep in mind. Truth is never defined by your personal experience. Now, we, we do it a lot of times. I, I, this happened to me, or I felt this, or I thought this, and therefore it must be. You ever had a moment in life where you made that certain claim, and then you found out later, well, it wasn't quite that. It wasn't quite like that. I really felt this, this urge, and so I acted on it, and you later come to find out that was a bad urge. <laughs> Yeah, don't give testimonies right now. That could be discouraging, huh? So truth isn't defined by what you experience. But we don't need to deny personal experience. Because we don't have a non-experiential faith, do we? Our faith, our belief in Christ is not just something that you read in the Bible, but you never really tangibly experience. No, what we, what we go through in the Christian life is something that we experience, and we experience very personally, very directly, very transformatively. We do have experiences. We do not have a non-experiential faith, but a very real, very deep experiential faith in God. It's personal, powerful, it has a real effect, a transforming effect. What is genuinely believed about Christ will be personally experienced as a Christian. Yes, I get it. We have to be careful. Personal experiences do not determine or define what's true. The Bible does that. But what is scripturally true should be, and I think will be personally experienced by those who embrace it. And what I see in this is that Christianity and knowing that you're a Christian that is something you can actually know for certain. Because that's what he's saying here. I know that you are a Christian. I know that you're a Christian church. And I find that to be very, very encouraging. Paul is saying, I know that you're a believer. You're a believing congregation. Which reminds me that true Christianity can be known. You can know that you are in fact a true believer. You can have confidence in Christianity yourself. And even here, did you notice he's saying, I have great certainty about your faith. You can even know that others are Christians. Now maybe you've been hesitant about that. Maybe you've, you've seen people walk away from the faith, and so you say, ah, that makes me hesitant to say I can, I can know that someone's a believer. You've, you've seen people turn on the Lord. We've seen that. We've seen that here in our church. And you start saying, how, how do I know for certain that I'm a Christian? Well, I want you to look again. Is Paul uncertain? I am so grateful to God for you because I know. I know about your salvation. 1 John chapter 5, verse 13 reminds us, these things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. The Bible is not written so you might be uncertain. The Bible is written so that you might know. To give clarity. The writer of the book of Hebrews, writing to a people who were on the precipice of abandoning, abandoning the faith because of the challenges of their life and the circumstances around them, said in chapter 6, verse 9, chapter 6 is that really challenging passage that talks about what happens to those who walk away from the faith. But in verse 9, he says this, but beloved, we are convinced of better things concerning you and things that accompany salvation. We're, we're convinced. 
We don't have that uncertainty about you. Paul even said of Timothy in 2 Timothy 1.5, I am mindful of the sincere faith within you, which first dwelt in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and I am sure that it is in you as well. How do you say that about someone? How do you say that about someone? Likely because you've, you've shared life with them. You've, you've seen the work of faith and the labor of love and the steadfastness of hope in their life. And that's the testimony of the work of the Spirit of God. And it shows that they are, in fact, a believer, that you are a believer. I think it's categorically wrong for anyone to suggest that true Christianity within yourself or in another cannot actually be known. Because if it can't be known, then what in the world is Paul saying here? What's he saying? And notice there is an intentionality to what he comprehends about them. I'm remembering, I'm I'm knowing, here he was remembering in verse 3, he's knowing, it's present tense again, I'm constantly knowing this. As if I'm bringing it up in my mind with certainty and actuality. And what he knows is about their salvation. That's what he knows. They are true Christians. Yes, I'm sure that it's possible that there might have been some within the congregation who were not genuinely converted that Paul might not be cognizant of. But when he thinks of this church as a whole and he remembers when he was with them and he preached the gospel and he watched what happened and he spent time with them day in and day day out, daytime and nighttime, he knows About this church in general, he knows they're believers. Now, I want you to see the three ways he expresses this knowledge. Here's what he knows about them and their Christianity. Are you ready? Here's intentional comprehension. First, he knows that you are a family in God. You are a family in God. I want you to see that in verse 4. Knowing and then he just uses this, uses this little word, brethren. Brethren. Pause on that just for a moment. You say, well, okay, we're going way too slow here. No, I, I want you to pause on that. He uses this term to refer to the Thessalonians 19 times in this letter. Now, I know if you've read the Bible before, you're going to come back to me and say, well, Paul uses this word all the time. This is so common But it's actually more intense in this letter than any other letter that he's ever written. What is unique here in this letter is that in proportion to the number of verses in this book, in comparison with the number of verses in other books that Paul has written, this is the highest concentration of time, times that Paul ever uses this term brethren. He means this. When he looks at them, he looks at them as if they are a part of the family of God and not just the family of God, his family in God. We are brethren, he says. Now, I know that word gets thrown around a lot, so much that sometimes it feels meaningless. Like when I was a kid growing up in the church, the only person we ever called brother was the pastor. Brother Jim, Brother David, those were some of my pastors. Unless you had a doctorate, then you never called him brother. I guess once you get a doctorate, you're not a brother anymore, something like that. But we never called each other brother. We never called each other brother or sister. We just called the preacher's brother. I I don't know why. Maybe it was some kind of word of respect. But this is the common word, isn't it? For who we are in Christ. But I want you to think about what this word means in the fullest biblical sense here. To whom does he say this? Well, keep in mind, this church in the northeastern corner of what is modern Greece today was primarily Greek, not Jewish. And Paul is Jewish. This is not brethren in any kind of ethnic terminology, is it? He doesn't look at them and say, ah, because you're, you're Jewish people together with me, you're my brothers. No. There's no natural kinship that's being referred to here. This is not mere friendship. We can use that term sometimes that way. He doesn't use this of people outside of the faith with whom he shares maybe some strong acquaintance or friendship. It's not how he uses this word. He's calling fellow Christians brethren. I want you to note he's not just calling the men 
brethren. It's the whole church. The whole church. Why doesn't he say brothers or sisters? You might have a version of the Bible that translates that brothers and sisters. Because it's trying to even out the, you know, the gender here and say, no, this refers to everybody. And it's kind of common in our, our era to do that. But you miss something. You miss something if you do that. That's not the term. He didn't just use a term that is kind of gender neutral. He uses a term that does have masculinity to it. He calls them brothers, brethren. Why? What makes us all brethren? Well, you say, well, it is a family term. Yes, but think about this more carefully. This is similar to what we looked at recently when we considered why it is that we we approach God in prayer by calling on him as our father. You remember that? Just recently, as we were going through Matthew chapter 6, and he teaches us to pray, Our Father who is in heaven. How how can we call God our Father? Why do we call God our Father? It's because we were all created in his image. There's something about him that we, we bear his image, unlike anything else in the world, anything else in the universe. Only humanity bears the image of God. In fact, salvation is all about bringing you back into the image of God where sin has marred that image. And the fullest image of God is the person of Jesus Christ, right? He is the fullest display of the image of God, and we are being conformed in our salvation to his image. And what is the great title that we often use and the Bible often used to speak of Jesus? He is the Son of God. And more than anyone else, he appealed to God as Father because he bears the image of God perfectly. We bear his image, so we are his children. Or as we said when we were studying this together, the real term that the Bible uses to describe the children of God is the sons of God. The sons of God. We are all the sons of God. Not just the men. Everyone. We are all the sons of God. Why? Because sonship in the Bible speaks of a privileged position that you have. As if you were the firstborn son. And you're going to get all of the inheritance belonging to the father. That's true of everyone who is in Christ. Regardless of gender. It's a term that speaks of position. So if we're the sons of God, what does that make us in relationship to each other? Brethren. Because we all share that privileged position as the sons of God. Therefore, we have that privileged position as firstborn sons. That's how he looks at us. As if the fullness of his inheritance belongs to all of us. And we should look at each other as if we bear that image of God that makes us his sons, that privileged position, that privileged promise of the inheritance. We're family. That's who we are. We are family. We are God's children. We're his sons that makes us all brethren together. Do you, do you actually look at each other and think in those kinds of theologically rich ways about each other? Or do you just kind of think about each other in terms of just common relationship, which can get a bit frustrating at times? Because no one really lives up to the expectations that we have of them. We enjoy people more at more times, sometimes more at one time than another. We understand all that. But we look at each other, we refer to each other as the people of God, the children of God, the sons of God. We're brethren together. I think when Paul says this and uses this term, it's loaded with saving purpose here. It's rich with biblical meaning. We're not just the family of God, though. Notice also, he knows that you are loved by God. See that? Knowing brethren, sons of God, You are beloved by God. Beloved by God. Now, it might be easy to look at this word and say, well, to be loved by God, well, everybody's loved by God. Doesn't God love the world? John 3, 16, for God so loved what? The world. The world. Who's in the world? Well, you are. Everybody is. God loved the world. That's not how he uses this word, though. 
This isn't referring to everyone in the world. You say, well, how, how do you know that? Because he's talking about those who are believers in Christ. So yes, there is a sense in which love can be shown to all the world, and there is an aspect of love that God has for the world. But it's also true that there is a particular love that he reserves for those who are his in salvation. For example, in 2 Thessalonians 2.16, you read this statement, Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, listen to this, who has loved us and given us eternal comfort and good hope by grace. All of those words refer to those who are loved by God in a saving way, who experience the salvation of God. There is a unique expression of the love of God towards those who are in Christ. And we all understand that kind of particular love, loyal love, reserved love, love of intimate choice. You don't love everyone like you love your spouse, do you? You better not. You better not. You don't love everyone like you love your spouse. That would be immoral love. That would be disloyal love. That would be sinful love. That would be adulterous love. You do not love the unbelieving world in the same way in which you love your family who is in Christ, do you? I hope not. We're told in 1 John 2.15, listen, do not love the world. Now, wait a minute. If John 3.16 says, God loved the world, and then 1 John, same author, says, don't love the world, there has to be a different kind of love, right? There has to be a different kind of expression of love. Do not love the world, nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. We are not to have a loyal kind of devoted love for the world that is actually reserved for the love we are called to have for God. There's a difference. When Paul says to them, you are the beloved of God, he actually uses this in a tense in the Greek language to say, you have always been loved by God and you continue to be loved by God even up to this very moment. It has always been true in God that he has loved you in this saving way and it remains true to this very moment. And he even says, I know it. I know that you are beloved by God. Listen to John again in 1 John 3, 1. See how great a love the Father has bestowed on us that we would be called the children of God? Now, that's a particular love, isn't it? That's a certain kind of love that he would call us his very own children. And such we are. For this reason, the world does not know us because it doesn't know him. 1 John 4.10, and this is love. Not that we loved God. God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. 1 John 4, 19, you know this one well, I'm sure. You've, you've at least heard it. We love because he, what? First loved us. Why do you love? Why do you love God? with loyal love because he loved you with loyal love first. Why do you love each other with that particular kind of Christian love as brethren? Because God set his love on you first. If he didn't do that, I would never love. I never would. Inherent in me is to love me, is to be loyal to me, is to make you subservient to my desires to be loved most. It's in all of us. We all love ourselves to some degree or another. Even those who are really upset with themselves, they love themselves. They're so upset with themselves because they really love themselves so much and they're not getting what they want. Right? Because we inherently love ourselves. That's the fundamental problem of why we're not Christians. It's because we love ourselves preeminently and if God had not loved us first we would have stayed in that kind of damning self-love you need to be liberated from loving yourself do you know that 
You need to be liberated from loving yourself. And you are because God calls you his beloved. And that is astounding, isn't it? Why would God look at people like us who can't get enough of ourselves to the exclusion of God ever look at us and say, but I love you with a loyal love that you have never even dreamed of showing me? Why would he do that? I don't know. I don't know. I can't think of a good reason. There isn't a good reason. Not in us. He did it because he did it. He loved us. Try to find a good reason and you'll simply magnify yourself. Oh, he loved me because I've, I'm, <laughs> I'm worth loving. I mean, you would never say that, but sometimes we kind of think it. At least I'm not like them. I can see why he would show me grace, but not them. Oh, then you don't understand grace, right? Because grace is showing someone loving favor when they are undeserving of loving favor. And that's how he's loved us. Never take for granted. Never pass over those words too quickly. When he calls them the loved of God, I know, family, you are the loved ones of God. That is profound, isn't it? But there's a third way he expresses, he expresses his knowledge here of their salvation. You're the family of God. You're loved by God. And third, you are chosen by God. How much time do I have? Okay. We're going to put it in park, all right? You're chosen by God. This is really the fundamental element of Paul's intentional comprehension. He intentionally comprehends God's electing love of them to be the children of God. That's what he says. Knowing, brethren, beloved by God, his choice of you. Now, literally, this phrase, if you were to study it in the original language, it reads, knowing the election of you. Or the word can be trans translated as the selection of you. The word itself means selection. Choice means selection or election. It is it's even articular here, meaning it has a definite article in front of it in the Greek. The choice, the election, the selection of you. What is interesting is that the pronoun his is not in the original Greek. So if you're reading the New American Standard like I am here, it says, knowing brethren, beloved by God, and his is in italics. Do you see that? Which that means the editors have put that in to smooth out the English and give you the sense of what this means. But it's not there in the original language. So it literally means knowing the choice of you. And that has caused no small amount of problem in church history. Some have suggested that the phrase should be read knowing the selection of you. Or that is the selection you made of God, your choice of God. Or it could be read, and, and both of these would, would likely be ways you could see it, grammatically, perhaps. It could be read the selection that was made of you by God. So how do you know? Is this your selection of God, or is this God's selection of you? How do we know? Well, the argument here that's being made is not, how do we know that you chose God? That's not what he's talking about here. That's not the emphasis here. You are the ones he made the family of God. You are the ones he set his love on and has always loved and continues to love. So it would not make sense even in this section just to say, I know that he set his love on you. He made you the family because I know your choice of him. You see why? Well, I, I think it could make sense well, then that would mean that your salvation is built purely and solely on you. He loves you because of what you have done. You have become the family of God because of what you have done. In fact, no English translation translates that phrase that way. Meaning those who translate the Bible for a living don't see this as you choosing God, but of God choosing you. 
Furthermore, when you look at the usage of this very word that's used for choice, <clears throat> it becomes even clearer. Paul uses the term five times in the New Testament. And if you examine all five of the occurrences, they all refer to God's choice, not the choice that someone else made of him. You look in Romans 9, verse 11, chapter 11, verse 5, verse 7, verse 28, and here, and all of these uses seem to indicate that it is God's choice of you. Romans 11, 5, in the same way then, there has also come to be at the present time a remnant, talking about Israel, there is a remnant according to God's gracious choice. God is the chooser, even in regard to Israel and their eventual and ultimate salvation. Romans eleven twenty eight. 28, from the standpoint of the gospel, they, Israel as a nation, are enemies for your sake. But from the standpoint of God's choice, there it's very clear, of God's selection, they, Israel, are beloved. They're loved for the sake of the fathers. Peter is the only other person to use this particular word, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 10. Therefore, brethren, be all the more diligent to make certain about his calling and choosing you. So all the other references that use this word, they don't talk about our choosing God. They talk about God's choosing us. And so it likely is here that way too. Well, that brings up a sticky subject, doesn't it? That brings up a hard subject. Does God choose people to salvation or do people choose God unto salvation well I would say the biblical answer to that question is yes does that help you it's yes do people make a choice to follow God oh yes real choices you did if you're a Christian you you likely prayed and called on God to have mercy on you you, you turned away from your sin. You walked away from sin. You said, I don't want to live in this any longer. I don't want to follow my sinful self any longer. I want to follow Christ. And you turned to him. Yes, people choose to follow Christ. The real question that we struggle with at times is, does God choose who will follow Christ? Does God choose? Careful theologians will all affirm that real choices of human will are always involved in salvation. People do come to Christ willingly. They exercise their will. They don't come to Jesus unwillingly. No one comes to Christ forced against their will. They come willingly. But God exercises his choice also. He chooses And that's the real question. Does God choose people to be saved? And if so, is that before they choose him? After? Because of? I want to address that this morning. I don't know if I've ever fully addressed that. And I can't do it in all of the time that's remaining here. But I'm going to do it in probably a more direct way and full way than perhaps I have in the past. I simply want to look at what does the Bible say. All right, so I'm not interested in is Brett that label? Is Brett that label? Now you can walk out of here and you can say, oh, I know what label he is. I really don't care. I really want to know what does the scripture tell us? What does it say? Because I'm not accountable to anybody's understanding of a label. I'm, I'm accountable to what does the Bible say? And when I want to understand the Bible, I have to understand it on its terms. Now listen, if it leads me to a place of tension and it doesn't relieve the tension, I can't come up with some other way to read it that makes me feel better about it. I've got to read it and let it, let it lead me where it does. And then I'm, I'm, I'm given a, a real decision in front of me. Will I take that at what it says? tension and all and embrace it 
Or, or what am I going to do with it? And listen, I, I'm not going to pretend, oh, this is easy. This is easy. Anybody who, who doesn't come down on the position I take, they, they just don't understand theology. They're, they're kind of a theological blockhead. <laughs> I don't think that. Christians have been discussing this for a very long time. So what I want to do is just address what the Bible says about this. So I, 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 I can't get into every single detail, but we'll, we'll look at some of this. The word for choice that's used here is not the only word in the New Testament that can be translated as chose or election or elect. There are more, and I want to take a little time to review the most significant terms. Again, there are many of them, and if you're really into that, I can suggest some resources that just walk you through all of the terms that refer to this. But let me give you a few. So this is where we're going to spend the the balance of our time. And all this kind of sets us up for next week, all right? So just hang on. That means you've got to come back next week because I'm not done. There's another word, to choose, to choose. Yes, it's translated similarly here, but choose is the Greek term ireo. Ireo, it's used three times in the New Testament, meaning to choose. Two times, it refers to people making specific choices between what they will and will not do. For example, in Philippians 1.22, Paul says, If I'm to live on in the flesh, this will mean fruitful labor for me, for I do not know which to choose. So there's two choices in front of him. Which should I pick, to stay or to be with the Lord? To be with the Lord, to stay with you. I don't know which to choose. And, and there he, he puts it in front of us like he's got a real choice, doesn't he? So this word choose means a real legitimate choice. Hebrews eleven twenty five 25 talks about Moses choosing rather to endure ill treatment with the people of God rather than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. So he had a choice in front of him, sin or struggling through trusting in God and living for God. It was a choice and he chose to follow God. Neither of those verses has to do with choices made to become a Christian, though. This word, ireo, is used one other time. I want you to turn to it because it's not that far over. Just go to the right to 2 Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Look at verse 13. This one does have to do with salvation. Verse 13, but we should always give thanks to God for you, brethren. Kind of like we've just heard in 1 Thessalonians 1. Beloved by the Lord. There he says it again. Because, what does it say? God has chosen you from the beginning for what? Salvation. Through sanctification by the Spirit and faith in the truth. That is one of the most loaded verses about salvation you'll ever read, isn't it? I mean, it's just full of theological power. God has chosen you. And when did he choose you? From the beginning, from the beginning of the world, before time began, he chose you for salvation. And when he chose you for salvation, he made that choice that you would come through sanctification that comes by the Spirit and faith in the truth. So yes, it includes faith, it includes belief, it includes the truth of the Scripture, but it's the work of the Spirit to make you holy, and it is also God's choice. It's an interesting note. I was doing a lot of reading of a number of Christian men who've written on this subject And one who does disagree with the conclusion I have come to in understanding this subject, he wrote wrote this. He said, the Bible uses the term elect in a variety of ways. Never, however, is the word used to indicate that a group have been predestined to be saved. Never. He went on to quote a famous pastor of the mid-1900s saying, nowhere in the Bible are people predestined to go to heaven predestination is always to some special place of blessing. So predestination or election is always to a certain kind of service or how you'll serve the Lord, but never to go to heaven. 
He said further, after referencing a number of verses using the word election and election language, he said, not once is that word elect used to designate persons whom God has marked out for salvation. So I quickly went to the index in the back of this 533 page book. And I looked up the scripture index to see if 2 Thessalonians 2.13 was in there. And of all the verses that he does refer to, he never refers to this, book, this verse. I thought that was interesting. So I got another book that he wrote and I pulled it off and I said, this is a debate between him and some others. And I was looking and one of the guys refers to this verse and says, see, God chooses for salvation. And the other responds to this, but he never referred to this verse. What does this verse say? God has chosen you from the beginning for salvation. It seems clear. It's quite an oversight not to use that verse. But that's not the only place we see this used in terms of salvation. There's another term used in the Bible for election, used more frequently in the New Testament than the two words, one that you find in 1 Thessalonians and the one you find here. It means to pick, to pick, or again to choose. Eklegomai, it's used about 20 times in the New Testament. Five times it describes people making particular choices. Mary has chosen the good part, it says in Luke 10.42. Luke 14.7, they had been picking out the places of honor at the table. So they're selecting places to sit at a table. Acts chapter 6, verse 5, the church chose Stephen to serve. Acts 15, 22, it seemed good to the apostles and the elders with the whole church to choose men from among them to send to Antioch. So it's referring to a selection that is made. You're choosing these from among a group, a chair from among many chairs, a man from among many men, disciples from among many disciples. In fact, that's how it's used eight times to refer to Jesus choosing the 12 apostles. And he's choosing the 12 apostles from among many disciples. He's choosing. He's selecting. This word is also used one time, eklegomai, to refer to Jesus as being the chosen one of God. Luke 9.35. One time, eklegomai is used of God choosing the patriarchs to establish Israel in Egypt. Acts 13.7. Another time, God chose that the Gentile world would hear the gospel, Acts 15, 7. But 16 times, six times, six times, it refers to God choosing those who are Christians. Let me give them to you. Just jot them down. And you can go back, and I'd love for you to read through these through the week and just meditate on them. Mark 13, 20. Mark 13, 20. Unless the Lord had shortened those days... No life would have been saved but for the sake of the elect whom he chose. He shortened the days. So there is a group of people called the elect whom God chose. They're elect because God chose them, not because they chose God. That's what makes them elect. 1 Corinthians 21, 27, and 28. 1 Corinthians 1, 27, and 28. Listen, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world. And he's talking about people who don't have erudite understanding, the foolish people, the uneducated of the world. He's chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. And God has chosen, it's mentioned again, the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong and the base things of the world to despise. God has chosen a third time. The things that are not so that he may nullify the things that are. He's chosen them for what? For salvation. The very people you think can't have the wisdom of God, God has chosen them to bear it in salvation. Who has chosen? God has. Ephesians 1 verse 4. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we would be holy and blameless before him. And it goes on in verse 5 to say, in love he predestined us to adoption as sons. He chose us. It's very clear. Some would say, well, he chose us that you would be holy. That is, that you would, be, you would live in a holy way. Holy and blameless before him. 
is your salvation, my friends. To be holy and blameless before him is to be saved. He chose you to be saved. Clearly, the word is used to speak of God's choosing people to salvation. There's another term. It's the term elect or chosen, eklektos. It's the noun form of what we just looked at, elect. Jot down Matthew twenty-two fourteen. You know this verse. You've heard it. Matthew twenty-two fourteen. For many are called, but few are what? Many are called, few are chosen. Luke eighteen seven. Now will not God bring about justice for His elect? who cry to him day and night, and will he delay long over them? Who are the elect? Those are the ones God has chosen. Romans 8, 33, who will bring a charge against God's elect? Or you could just say God's chosen ones. Colossians three twelve. so as those who have been chosen by God, those who have been elect of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Why do you live a holy life? Because you have been chosen by God. What motivates holiness? Your having been chosen by God. Listen to 2 Timothy 2.10. For this reason... This is so profound. For this reason, I endure all things for the sake of those who are chosen so that they also may obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus and with it eternal glory. This is so profound. Paul will go through anything so that the chosen will come to salvation. That's what he says. I'll go through whatever I have to go through to preach the gospel so that those who are chosen might come to salvation. Titus 1.1, Paul, a bondservant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ for the faith of those chosen of God and of the knowledge of the truth, which is just a synonym for salvation, the knowledge of the truth, which is according to godliness. There's another word. The word for called, the word for called, you say, well, we just heard that many are called. Yes, it's used that way in a general sense there, but there's another way in which this word called klesis is used in the New Testament. Jot down 1 Corinthians 1, 2. To the church of God, which is at Corinth, to those who have been sanctified in Christ Jesus, listen to this, saints by calling. Why are you a saint? Because you have been called. By whom? God. Jude 1. Jude, a bondservant of Jesus Christ and brother of James to those who are the called. Who's he referring to? Christians. You're the called. Well, what about that other word out there that we, we love to, the, the Presbyterians use all the time? Let's, let's talk about it. Predestined. It's the word pro horizo. Horizo means to determine or to mark out. It's like a horizo means we get the English word horizon. Put pro on the beginning of that and it means to mark out a horizon or a destination ahead of time. Pro horizo. Predestined. Pre mark. Mark out ahead of time. There are actions that are predestined by God. Acts 4 28. God has caused things to happen so that whatever your hand and your purpose predestined to occur, it occurred. Gospel wisdom that is applied to Christians is predestined. 1 Corinthians 2, 7, we speak God's wisdom in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God predestined before the ages to our glory. He predestined saving wisdom to our glory. But people are predestined also. Listen to Romans 8. For those whom he foreknew, and you say, oh, there's a word. Yeah, hold on to that one, all right? We're coming. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined. And what did he predestine? He predetermined that they would be conformed to the image of his son, which means salvation, doesn't it? 
That's what that means. You were predestined, and who was predestined? Whoever is foreknown is predestined. It's important that you see that. All who are foreknown are also predestined. And if you trace that out throughout the rest of it, it becomes very interesting. He predestined to become conformed to the image of his son so that we would be the firstborn, he would be the firstborn among many brethren, and these whom he predestined, he also called. Who did he call? Everyone who was predestined. And who's predestined? Everyone who was foreknown. So everyone foreknown was also called. That's what it says. And these whom he called, he also justified. So who's justified? Everybody who's called and predestined and foreknown. Everyone foreknown is also justified. And these whom he justified, he also glorified. So who's glorified? Everyone justified, everyone called, everyone predestined, everyone foreknown. Everyone foreknown is also glorified. Everyone who is foreknown is glorified. You say, wait a minute, that's confusing me. Because he knows everything about everyone, including those who aren't going to be glorified. So what does that mean? Well, hold on, I'm not there yet. I'm getting there. But he did predestine people, right? Ephesians 1, 5, he predestined us to adoption as sons. Again, all of us, adoption as sons, so that we have the privileged place. The inheritance is ours. We were adopted. That's salvation language, predestined to be adopted. Ephesians 1, 11, a powerful verse. Ephesians 1, 11. We have obtained an inheritance... Why have we obtained the inheritance? Having been predestined according to his purpose who works all things after the counsel of his will. He's working everything after his will, his known will. And he predestined us according to the purpose within that will. Does God predestine people to salvation? The text says he does. Well, what about that word foreknowledge? You say, well, doesn't that mean that God knows in advance what's going to happen? Well, it can refer to things that are known. The Jews knew about Paul ahead of time, it says in Acts 26, 5. There was information known before, like how false teachers would twist the scriptures, 2 Peter 3, 17. But listen to this, Jesus was actually foreknown. Think about this, Jesus was foreknown, 1 Peter 1.20. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but has appeared in these last times for the sake of you. Who was foreknown? Jesus was foreknown. Does that mean God knew what some guy named Jesus would do before time began? No, it's not referring to what Jesus would do. God knew him. That's important because Israel was also foreknown. Not just what they would do, but they as a people were foreknown. Romans eleven two. God has not rejected his people. It's referring to the nation of Israel, whom he foreknew. He's not rejected them. People are ultimately glorified in Christ, are foreknown. We saw that, those whom he foreknew. And you look at the unbreakable chain of redemption there. Everyone who is foreknown will be glorified. What does that mean? He didn't just know things that were going to happen. He knew you in salvation. He knew you. It's a knowledge of you before time began. It's a knowledge of you as his child. You are foreknown, not just things that would happen. Because everyone who is foreknown is a Christian. Do you understand that? The way this word is used in the Bible, everyone who is foreknown by God is a believer. It's not just knowing what people, including unbelievers, would do. No, He knew you. It's like he had a love relationship determined for you in foreknowledge. In a relationship, he knew you before time began. That's profound. The noun for foreknowledge is used about Jesus and his giving himself on the cross. This man, Acts 2.23 Acts 2.23, this man delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God. 
Jesus had planned, God had planned the death of Christ and all the events long before they ever happened. This wasn't just the series of random choices. It was known by God because it had been determined by God. It's used of being chosen according to the foreknowledge of God in 1 Peter 1, 2. We are chosen according to the foreknowledge, not just that God knew what we would do. We are chosen because God knew us. It's different. It's a relationship of saving knowledge. Now, why do I belabor this and go through all of this? And there's more we could go through. There are other words we could look at, trust me. To help us understand a fundamental principle within salvation, God chooses people for salvation. That is a simple fact in scripture. It's just a simple fact. It's there. You say, okay, but you're not answering all the questions I have. If, If that's true, then I have questions. If God chooses, does that mean that people can't choose him? If he chooses some to be saved, what about those who are not marked as the chosen? Does that mean they can't choose him? If God chooses, does that mean that people don't make actual choices because God has already chosen, so whatever you choose is not a real choice? If God chooses, how can anyone be found guilty of sin? And many of you are saying, now, yeah, that's what I want to know. Those kinds of questions. What role does a person having faith play in our salvation if God elects people before the foundation of the world? Why why do you have to believe? Why do you have to do anything? It's all chosen and predestined and foreknown. Well, what is equally necessary when thinking about these things is to consider how the Bible actually responds to all of those questions, right? What does the Bible say about it? Not, Not what works out in your mind. You say, okay, now that one makes sense to me. Because I'm going to tell you, there's some stuff in here that you're going to hear and you're going to say, well, I don't know how that works out. And I'm like, well, I don't know either. It says this and it says that. And I'm going to say, okay, it's tension. What am I going to do with it? Unless the biblical authors relieve the tension, I'm going to let it lie. For example, if God chooses, does that mean that some can't choose him? Well, here's the problem with that kind of a question. That's not the way the Bible speaks. It doesn't speak that way. It's not the way the Bible speaks about an unbeliever who refuses to follow Christ. They don't follow because they do not want to follow Christ. They willingly choose within their nature to reject God. You say, well, does that mean they they can't choose? No, the, the problem is they won't. They won't. Why? Because, as the Bible says in Romans 6 and Ephesians 2, we, we are all before Christ enslaved to sin. So here's, here's what you do. Do you have free will? We have free will as long as you, you choose whatever you want to do within your nature. What's your nature? Sinful? So guess what you're going to choose? Sin? If you're dead and you're set, trespasses and sins, that doesn't mean that you're alive to God. It means you're dead to God, Right? So what will you choose? You will choose what your nature tells you to choose. You're free within your nature. You make willing choices within your sinful nature. So they're real choices of their own will. And they are sinful choices because of their sinful nature. Well, if God is the one who chooses, then how, how in the world could God hold anybody guilty? Because God has made the choice. Well, how does the Bible talk about that? How does the Bible talk about this question? The way the Bible speaks of people engaging in sinful lifestyles is to describe their actions as willful and intentional and accountable to God. It's a difficult question. How could God find someone guilty when he is sovereign? Well, Paul anticipates that in Romans 9. He lays out this case about God being sovereign and choosing, and he he anticipates, he says, you will say to me then, because he hears what you're going to say, you will say to me then, why does he still find fault? Who resists his will? He's determined. On the contrary, Paul says, who are you, O man, who answers back to God? The thing molded will not say to the molder, Why did you make me like this, will it? 
You say, well, now wait a minute, that doesn't answer the question. It answers the fundamental issue. Who do we think we are in front of God? I believe when we look back on eternity, it will be safe to say that God was never unjust to the unbelieving world he judges. He's not unjust. They willfully, we willfully disbelieve outside of Christ. Don't forget, Ephesians 2, you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them, we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest were enslaved. This is why God chooses. Do you understand that? If he doesn't, if he doesn't choose to show mercy to anyone, all will die in their sin because all are dead in sin. That's why Ephesians 2 goes on to say, but God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, he made us alive. We did not make ourselves alive. He made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Why? So that in the ages to come he might show the surpassing riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Because we were all dead, we were all guilty, we all deserved punishment and he raised us so that he could say look here is the mercy of God why doesn't he do that with everyone I don't know the eternal mind of God and how he comes to that conclusion but I know that he will not only show the riches of his mercy that will astound us for all eternity he will also show the justice of his judgment on the willing unbelieving world and we will look at it and say he is just he is right you say but 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 how do i know if i'm chosen will you believe will you believe will you trust in him alone to save you will you repent of following yourself as your own god Will you turn away from the world and turn to God? God has not unveiled to us who the elect are before they believe. But belief in a life of faith in Jesus shows the hand of God, the choice of God. The quest in life is not to try to find out, am I elect so that I can believe? That's not not our quest. The quest is, will I believe? Will you turn? Will you embrace Christ? Here's how Jesus put it. Matthew 11. Jesus said, I praise you, Father. This is Matthew 11:25. 25. I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and intelligent and have revealed them to infants. Yes, Father, for this way was well-pleasing in your sight, All things have been handed over to me by my Father. And listen to this. No one knows the Son except the Father, nor does anyone know the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son wills to reveal him. God's sovereign, isn't he? The, who the son wills to reveal him. And the next, what's the next thing Jesus says after that? Come to me. You remember that? Who comes to the son 
Only those whom the Son wills to reveal the Father. So come to me, all of you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Here's what you can know for sure. If anyone wants to come to God, anyone desires to come to God and give their life to God and find his mercy, they will find salvation. Anyone who comes to him will not be turned away. Why do they come? Because he's chosen. So yes, whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Yes. Yes, whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. Amen. Yes. So come. Believe. Turn away from your sin. Peter tells us if you want to make your calling and election sure, you pursue a life of following Christ. You say, well, what what does all that have to do with 1 Thessalonians? Knowing, brethren, beloved by God, his choice of you. How did Paul know God's choice of them? You know how he knew? By their choices. What? That's right. He's going to talk about how he preached to them, verse 5, and how they responded to the gospel, and that's how he knows God chose them. You say, well, I didn't think our choices were in. No, our choices don't determine God's election. Our choices reveal God's election. That's why you got to come back next week, all right? That's a good morning to have the Lord's table too. Because what we're saying when we take the elements is, thank you. And there should be no arrogance. And there should be no flippancy toward the fact that you know the Lord. Because there's no reason in yourself that you should be a Christian. You are in Christ by his doing. You say, well, I, I, don't, I don't know if I'm a believer or not. Well, friend, look at Christ. What does he say about himself and what it means to come? And I would tell you, if you'll come to Christ, he won't turn away from you. He'll receive you. But if you remain in your sin, you're outside of Christ. So when we take the Lord's table, we're thanking God for his mercy and his choice. Let's pray together. Father, how we pray that as we think through these things together, we know there's so much more to be said about all of it, and many more questions to answer. But I pray for those who have an ongoing tension in their heart about this. I pray that you would convict them of what that tension in their heart says about them and what you say in your word. Lord, remind us, you're the Savior. No no one saves himself, herself. You alone save. We We can't do it on our own. It requires you to pull the, pull all of the shades away from the eyes so we see the beauty of Christ. Would you do that this morning for the unbelieving Lord? Let them see the glory of Christ because we know if they see who he is and what he's offered and how much love you have shown, they will come running to him, leaving sin behind. And I pray that you would cause that to happen this morning. Would you do it by your grace? And I pray that there would be a real satisfaction and a real gratitude in our hearts that you have caused us to be in Christ. We know where our hearts go if we're left to ourselves, and it's not toward you. So God, please, help us to be thankful, humble, grateful, eager to share the gospel, trusting in the power of the gospel, 
to save. And as we take of the Lord's table, I pray we do so with profound, deep thankfulness and confident faith in our one and only Savior, Jesus. We pray in his name. Amen. I'm going to ask the men, if they would, come forward.